Hello and welcome to another episode of the Uncommon Energy Podcast. On this week's episode, we're going to be taking a look at the results from a bunch of tournaments that took place this past weekend. We'll start things off by talking about the Orlando and Perth Regional Championships and then also the Singaporean Regional League Tournament that also took place this past weekend. We've got a few new cards to take a look at, some that look pretty interesting, pretty promising, including a reprinted a spec of old we will of course have guess that flavor text everyone's favorite segment of the podcast and then we're going to wrap things up by talking about the champions league aichi tournament that took place over in japan this past weekend which is a tournament in the brand new format it has the cards in it that will be legal come twilight masquerade in just over a month now at this point the new set yeah. already just around the corner which is pretty crazy to say since we're only two tournaments into this format but it is what it is and then of course we'll close things out on our bonus episode over on the patreon if you want to get a little bit of extra content from us ask us some questions or hear our takes on how to survive a spider attack that is something we talked about a couple of <laughs> weeks ago <laughs> over on the patreon you can check it us out uh, patreon.com slash uncommon energy podcast my name is chipper g joined here as always by my friend and co-host azul gg what's up azul how we doing how does it feel to be back home after two weeks away uh it feels pretty good uh to be back home yeah it's been a little while two it's been over two weeks no it's been like two weeks then right two two and a half yeah, I mean, I Maybe. guess you left, what, like Monday before EUIC, yeah. and then you got back last, I mean, this Monday, this week from Orlando. So, yeah, two weeks, right? Yeah, two weeks. I guess it kind of feels like three weeks because I was sick for that week leading up to when I was leaving. So, I was, like, wasn't doing anything, like, content-wise uh, at all for a while. But, yeah, it feels good to be home. It's been a little while, um, but, you know, had still a pretty busy day despite not doing any content stuff, you know, laundry to do, meal prepping. So getting set up ready for the week to come. Catching up on life. Yeah, catching up on life a little bit for sure. And honestly, it's not even that long before I'm going to be gone for a while again because I don't know, it's like three weeks until Indianapolis. And then I got a two week or back to back event weekends, Indianapolis into Stockholm in Sweden. Man, there's uh, still a lot of traveling coming up at the end of this year. I guess there'll be a little bit of break between that and LA, but then LA into. I, NAIC right after that so yeah final home stretch here of the the majors and stuff before that break before worlds but yeah feeling good did a little bit of break from the traveling uh did get what top 64 at where were we Orlando uh <laughs> honestly I feel like I could have definitely done better I don't know I guess I say that but like my two losses I just drew really slow in both of my losses that kind of put me out of contention so I like say that but like I don't know it was tough. I, I, I didn't feel great. You could have really done. Yeah, I don't. I didn't feel great going today, too. I can tell you that much. I didn't feel great. I don't know if there's much more I could have done play wise. Um, I'm sure in the moment back at the tournament, I had more thoughts on my play. But um, yeah, just like slow starts overall is what kind of caught me in day two. I uh, was yeah. able to go into day two with that 7 1 1 record again, just like UIC, which is really nice. It's a really big difference to be able to take a loss with that record. So that was really nice to be able to do that, but wasn't able to fully capitalize on it, unfortunately. Nice to take one loss. Been... Not so nice when you take two, right? Yeah, once you get that second loss, it's kind of kind of over from there. That's when I kind of check out of tournaments. When I can't like top eight a tournament anymore, I just go on autopilot a little bit. Um, sometimes I like focus up if it's like if I get to that last round and win gets me like top sixteen Stipend or top thirty two or, or whatever. Yeah, yeah. I'm usually not too con. I'm not like dude, I'm kind of checked out once I can't make top eight. To be honest, uh, not that I'm like throwing horrendously or anything, but like I'm a little bit less. Worried about checking my prize card, stuff like that. Um, just kind of take the gas. The, the You're just kind of playing poke at that point. Yeah. What is the take the foot off the pedal a little bit? Yeah. Foot off yeah. the gas. That's what I'm thinking. Foot of. Off yeah. The gas. <laughs> Going through the you motions. Had, yeah. You had back to back weekends as well of travel, Chip. I did. Yeah. How was, uh, how'd you like Orlando? I guess. Yeah. Orlando's cool. I, 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 I you, don't, huh? What so you casted Orlando? Yes. And you, what'd you do in EUIC? I was hosting at EUIC. Hosting at EUIC. So with the back-to-back, -back, I think like previously you had said before that you prefer, like your favorite thing is play-by-play uh, -play casting, right? Yes, which is what I got to do this weekend. I was paired up with Pablo Tableman Meza, which is great. Pablo is awesome to get to work with. He's super knowledgeable. Um, basically, anytime, yeah, I mean, I love 
everyone who I've gotten to like work with and cast with and stuff, but um, it feels great to, you know, pair up with someone who's like just been playing the game for as long as he has at like a high level um, makes things pretty easy. Like we're usually thinking about the same thing when we're like, I can talk about what I'm talking about and throw it to him and like know what he's going to say before he says it. So it's like, it creates a good uh, back and forth, I think. Um, yeah, yeah, definitely. But yeah, it was good. Um we did have some issues with the podcast last week, though, which I do want to apologize for. I accidentally uploaded the wrong video to start with, so I had to delete it and then re-upload. And then also we had a, like an audio issue with Azul's microphone, which was really annoying because we were sitting right next to each other. Uh, so apologies for the issues with Azul's mic. Um, yeah, I, but I hopefully guess it never... wasn't too unbearable. I don't, do we, I don't think we ever really figured out what was wrong. I think it maybe it was like it was like slightly unplugged. Yeah, I think that That's has to be what it was more than because likely. Because we, we did some more uh, recording after that with the mics. And I, yeah. oh, for, as far as I can tell, like that all sounded fine. So, yeah. And speaking of the more recording, that's something else we can, I guess, just tease mention as well. And I did record a handful of videos while he was here. You know, he stayed with me for the week between euic and orlando um and yeah we got a few videos recorded which will hopefully be going up on the second channel the uncommon energy channel if you haven't seen that the link to that is in the description of all of the videos but yeah it's the the channel where we do more like pokemon tcg gameplay related stuff and specifically tabletop gameplay related stuff um as of now there's other types of things we want to do as well but uh it basically any tcg related content that is not sitting down and talking for an hour and a half to two hours is over there on that channel so feel free to check it out we're pretty proud of the stuff we've been putting out over there and we uh definitely want to keep doing that yeah yeah definitely go check that out excited for the the new stuff we've already done and what we're gonna do in the future always looking to improve and stuff like that so yeah and hopefully the plan should be to release a video every three ish weeks from here on out yeah. I'm going to try to work on the first one and get it posted in the next one to two weeks. No, like, hard commitment there. I think uh should be okay to do that, though. Um, but, yeah, really a lot of it comes down to when I'm able to have time to, like, edit them and put them all together. And that is one of the things as well with it is that um, we want it to be, like, a pretty good quality thing. So it takes me a while to get things edited. I am – uh, very self-taught when it comes to all the editing stuff. I think I do okay with it, but uh, I probably don't do things in the most efficient way. <laughs> like even uh, sometimes, like when Azul was over here and he was watching me like click around in my OBS settings, he was like, dude, <laughs> why are you clicking that button? Why wouldn't you just click this button? <laughs> I'm like, I don't know, man. That's just the button I've always clicked. I don't know. <laughs> like two extra clicks. Goes that up. Especially when you're editing a lot. Actually, like I recently watched a video one of uh, Senpai Gaming's video mm -hmm. videos where it was like a quick tutorial on like editing their short or something in, I don't even know if it was in Premiere Pro, which I use, but just like yeah. learning some of the shortcuts can make things so much faster. It does, yeah. Some of like the few, cause you like use the same, you do the same action multiple times in a video. So if you shortcut it every time, you know, that's like 10 seconds each time or something up, like yeah. that. Yeah, so. Yeah, I know like to learn the that. main shortcuts that I use consistently, but I'm sure there are still ways I could optimize my my editing process. I've thought about honestly taking yeah. like an Adobe course or something like that. Might be worth it. It might be. It might be. We'll see. There's like, like a basics one, maybe at least with the yeah. shortcuts. Anytime I don't know how to do something, I literally just like go to YouTube and watch a tutorial. Yeah. Whether or not I retain that information, I usually probably don't. <laughs> and then I have to rewatch the tutorial the next time I want to do it again, but yeah, I have those. yeah, if you don't do it consistently, it doesn't stick. Right, exactly. Um, yeah, so we had a couple events this weekend. The one we and you were both at. I guess we could start with that, right? Yes. Orlando. Yep. Biggest regional of all time, right? But it wasn't bigger than EUIC. It was I'm not. Tripping. Yeah. Um, not bigger than EUIC, but it was the biggest regional championship of all time. Uh, is Indianapolis going to beat it? It might be close, mm. honestly. Yeah, it's going to be close. I mean, I guess Indianapolis still has, what, three weeks? Yeah. To build up. Could those, still get some more numbers, yeah. Yeah, those last minute, uh, last minute people registering, which not, not many regionals have had that time to have, get that last minute accumulation happening, right? Like most of them sell out instantly, or right. close instantly. Instantly, yeah, we're almost at three k. Yeah, at the start of the season, at least, really, really, the last like couple months in North America, the tournaments have not been instantly selling out. Yeah, uh, there's been a little bit of leeway. 
We'll see what happens come NAIC time, to be honest. Might be It'll probably sell out pretty fast. A little sketchy, but we'll we'll get it sorted. We'll get it figured out. Actually, I'm happy that I ended up this quarter. I got the, I don't have to really like stress about it. I got the stipend for NAIC, which is nice. Because then you get like the, what, 24 hours to register before everyone else. And you're you probably the only one who the, got it without going to, going to a local. <laughs> yeah, most likely. Yeah, almost definitely. <laughs> Which is kind of cool. I'm still going to try and get that end of year top 16 spot without going to a League Cup. Um, I think, I think it was you are like... ranked 16th currently, right? Am I? Yeah, uh, 15th. Jeez, what are you guys doing, bro? This I'm not going to lie. This is embarrassing. I have not been to a single local tournament this whole season. And hey, I do go to every major tournament or most of them. But most of the people on this list have been to more major tournaments than me or just as many. So, yo. This is, if I don't have to win NAIC to get a top 16 slot, what, come on, what are you guys doing out here? What is happening? Honestly, buddy, yeah. it might be worth it just in case to go get like a League Cup win or two. I want to embarrass them with it. I'm going to get <laughs> 16th. I'll get, I don't know, some like top eight or something at NAIC at least. Mm. Like Squeaking at, I'll come out of low number, man. I don't need to I be mean, first. here's the question, though. Are you going to feel annoyed if the final standings get posted and you're 17th and you're behind 16th by 10 points. No, not really. You're not going to feel annoyed that if you had just no. won a eight person league challenge, you would have, but I could have done better at like, I could have got another top eight at a regional or won a regional or gone. Yes, further but in that's a, a little more difficult than winning a league challenge. Yeah, it's like all the same thing. That's why, I, that's why I feel better. Think about it anyway. So sure. Yeah. I mean, the plan will just be to do well at NAIC, secure my top 16 slot without using without going to any locals. And then I'll add Nico on Twitter. Cause I think me and Nico had a little bit of back and forth on Twitter at the beginning of the season where I was like, nah, it's not that hard to actually get top 16. And I was like, I'm going to get top 16 this season without going to a local tournament. And I'm, I'm currently, I won't say I'm on track. But I'm not too far behind. The thing is, is that some of these people on the list probably can replace some regionals finishes. And probably it's can. probably pretty hard for you to replace some regionals finishes. I gotta win NAIC, then I guess that's gotta be the. I gotta top eight regionals or win NAIC. That's like my two ways to get points at this. Actually, that might be my only ways to get points. I could, no, my 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 regional finishes. I could still get like a top sixteen in there. I think maybe not. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, I got a top eight or uh, I got a top eight or yeah, like win NAIC or something. I'm down. I'm up for the challenge. <laughs> we'll see what happens, buddy. Good luck to you. Well, yeah, Orlando was two thousand three hundred. 69 players, largest regional championships of all time. Just about 150-ish players, less than EUIC the weekend before. Uh, but yeah, this was over in Orlando. Azul, what did you think about the city, the venue itself? Yeah, so I've been to Orlando quite a few times now. Uh, it's a nice time to go to Orlando, to be honest, or Florida in general. Yeah. Not too hot, still warm, but not like hot, not too humid. Got out of there, right? You know, probably a couple of weeks from now, it's going to start to get... Pretty Orlando like or Florida like, I should say. Sure, so, yeah. Uh, we can't be too far. It's gonna uh, start so. to get sticky before long, and that's no yeah. fun. And the cool thing about it, like, if you don't do well or if you're looking to, like spend some extra time, like, there's so much stuff to do in Orlando, right? All the amusement parks and theme parks and all that kind of yeah. stuff. I've done a couple of them at this point. It's not something I'd be interested in doing, but yeah, I mean, there's like there's so much stuff to do. Um, the general area and stuff in general. There's a ton of hotels and like places to get food and stuff so there's yeah i mean it's like a, a great location for um for regionals overall i feel like there's just so many things to do and yeah yeah and i did see someone say on twitter like orlando's a fine regional destination if you're someone who likes theme parks but if you don't like theme parks it's like not that great yeah. um and like as far as i don't know we've stayed we've we've been to some regionals and where like the convention area you can walk and go do something pretty easily go to a restaurant mm -hmm. um you know go out do anything like that like indianapolis for example is a great example of that it's the yeah, yeah. is right in the middle of downtown uh orlando is a bit more spread out right like you yeah, can't really yeah. be walking anywhere from the convention center so i think it gets like a docked a little bit in on that front from my point of view but it gets points because like there is so much else to do if you like are into the things that are available to do like i know plenty of people who you like even didn't go to like there were plenty of people who went to theme parks and stuff but i know plenty of people who just went out and played like late night putt putt right because mm -hmm. there's like just other things you can do which is cool that other cities may not have um yeah. what did you think about the... that oh go ahead 
I was going to mention on top of that, it's like a great location in general, not just for people in the U.S., but people out of the U.S. as well. Because yeah, there was true. 31 different countries were represented at uh, Orlando. I don't know if they all checked in, but going into the tournament, there was 31 countries registered. Yeah, so and some of them were 30. just like one person from a yeah. country, but, you know, still 31 countries represented, which is pretty yep. cool. Like, I think Tord was the only Norwegian player there, but... That makes sense, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we even have, like, I don't know, where's for, uh, Fabrizio from, what, Peru? Peru, yeah. There's yeah. probably another Peru. I would imagine there were more Peruvian players there. Back in day two. Yeah, oh, right here. Yeah. Diego Barrera is from Peru. Yeah, I mean, so that's kind of cool, too. And it's also, like, as far as, like, I'm just saying, like, from America, it's, like, cheap to fly there. I assume it's, like, pretty reasonable for... Uh, even the Europeans, Latin American players. That's why so many of them. It is like a destination location, yeah. right? So, and like, I, it's, I, I guess like... it's like physical positioning as well. It's like pretty close to South America compared to other places in the uh, in the U.S. So yeah, so I'd like say all, all in all, that. yeah, all in all, I've been a fan of Orlando as a location. Um, this time, was this this is the same convention center as it's been in Orlando? Though? It has to be, right? I'm pretty sure. Uh, at least as last year, the year before. Oh yeah, it, no, it definitely was last year. Yeah, the year before yeah. was Daytona, I think, right? Like the last time I was in Florida before that might have been. I think it's been a while. I think because it was like the 2022 like half season or whatever, and in 2019, I'm pretty sure the regionals was in Daytona, like the fall of 2019. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. There was one more thing I was going to mention about it as well. Now I'm just kind of location city convention center location. Oh yeah, the venue is massive. Like the convention center yeah. is like literally ridiculous. It is huge. So like we won't ever outgrow that venue as well. Yeah, we were next to some big like dance or cheer competition or something like that during day one. <laughs> the uh, kind of loud. Yeah, you could especially like up at the like top uh, tables. It was right next to the wall to the yeah. other side where the like cheer competition was happening. And it was like bumping. You could hear, yeah. like it wasn't just like hearing music. It was like boom, boom, like the deep bass, like shaking the wall almost. It felt like you mm -hmm. could feel the <laughs> the competition happening on the other side. But yeah, it's cool that it is big enough that, um, you know, I mean, theoretically, there could be a weekend where that's not happening and it's just Pokemon and we absorb both of those halls, right? So like that we won't be cool. that, that location. Uh, what did cool you think about uh, the tournament itself as a, little, as a competitor, how it was run, the uh, – uh time between rounds all that stuff we got out of there pretty early friday night or saturday night excuse me yeah i think we got out of there at like eight um i'm pretty I think sure Christian yeah. Minsky posted a tweet of the time being called in the round at like 7 50 or something like that yeah. in round nine yeah no everything went like really really smooth which is nice it's nice to see these like quicker turnaround times happening especially if like we get to the point where it's like we have so many players in the tournament do we need to add an extra round on day one or whatever it might be when we come to that point which we're getting close i feel like um, I mean, that's something we can talk about a little bit later when or we can maybe mention it right now, I guess, is like the, the people bubbling at 36 match points. It's happened at UIC. Uh, it happened at this one as well. Time call bubbling. It's 746 in round nine. Yeah, that's pretty good. So we're seeing like these really good progressive turnaround times, which is nice to see. And then like what kind of ties into that is like the eventual like, I don't think we're going to go indefinitely no matter how big these tournaments get at the 36 player or at the, what was I saying? Nine rounds, day one, six rounds, day two. Uh, eventually we're gonna have to get another round or extend top cut or something. Right. Yeah. And if the day one turnaround times keep getting better and better, we could see that being added to day one as opposed to day two. Right. Like maybe but you add a round and then to make day two, you have to have to be at least 21 match points or something. Right. 10 rounds, 21 match points or something. Sure. Yeah. That might be the thing to do. Honestly, um, cause I think that is one of the bigger concerns with, I mean, I don't know this for sure, but like, I think that is one of the bigger concerns with adding, changing the, um, tournament structure is like how, uh, right. how, how much time it would eat into, uh, into day two, like getting out of there at the end of the day. Yeah. Uh, cause TCG definitely. is always the last by like a long shot already mm -hmm. in day two. Uh, but I know like VG as well. They like want a little bit of a change up to their structure as well um they want more yeah more they round. want more round yeah because they're let me i think on this i can actually just pull up yeah. the vg standings orlando vgc masters if we look at swiss round 15 they have a top eight cut as well and this is what their bubble looks like because they don't have ties right so yeah. there was 
one, two, three, four players with 36 match points who made it in. And there was one, yeah. two, three, four, five players with 36 match points who did not make top eight. Man, that is so you basically had to go 13 and two. Yeah. Or hope guarantee. for good resistance. Yeah. That is that is tough, to be honest. That is tough. Um so. it, it, like knowing your record knowing the record you need though is like definitely nice. Whereas in well, I guess like you know the record you need in TCG as well, but like without ties being a factor, that is kind of nice. Like knowing that ties won't ever happen. It's just like I need to win. I need to win. I need to win. We time did see, is like not a there's no pressure for time in like how your results play out. We did see a pretty steep bubble here at this tournament at the 36 match points once again. So four people made it in with 36 match points. Two missed out, and they bubbled out on resistance, which means opponents, they opponents, had the resistance. exact same. Yeah, opponents, opponents, win percentage, opponents, opponents, resistance. So they had the exact same opponent win percentage, all three of these players, which is kind of crazy because I think the same thing happened in Vancouver, right? Yeah, we can go so to the you fact that it happened it twice is like nuts. Uh, and then so basically Cal Connor got ninth by 3% pretty much of the opponent's opponent's one percentage. Yeah. That's like a pretty big number though. So you can't feel too bad about it, I guess, but it still sure. feels bad. I guess like it came down to opponent's opponents. Like I guess that still feels pretty bad that it came down to opponent's opponents. And it is, it does feel like I, we mentioned this when we looked at Vancouver, I think I did. I, that felt like an anomaly. Like we'll probably never see this again. And it literally happened at Orlando, which was that the next regional championship, whatever it might be. Yeah. yeah. Where it comes down to three people tied on opponents win percentage and then it comes down to opponents opponents is maybe it's not as much of an anomaly as i think it is but i feel like I, this is the first two times this has ever happened where there's three i mean people. there's definitely been ties one way yeah right i had but one a three-way tie is, is definitely an anomaly yeah the three-way tie anomaly. feels yeah it <laughs> feels a little wild that's for sure so yeah i'm not too sure about that but yeah i, I mean one person with 36 match points whiffing out on cut. Uh, I guess we had, yeah, I guess we had two here. There was two here that whiffed out on 36 here. In EUIC, it was one, but it could have been two if Aiden had beat me in the last round at EUIC. Then it would have right. been two 36 match pointers missing out on cut. 36 match points is a lot. Um, I guess, like, there's, like, there needs to maybe be, like, a discussion. All right, I'm sure, like, this will have to be the thought process that happens at TPCI. It's just, like, I don't know, what's reasonable, right? Like, what margin of error should we allow before it's, like, okay, that person should make top cut, right? That would kind of be the question more so than anything. I don't know what that where that point is, to be honest. Is 12 and yeah, three, I feel like, should you make cut if you make 12 and three? Yeah, probably, right? I mean, that's like a good percentage of your rounds. Um, I think we can call it 12 and three. Like, if you end up with too many ties, that's probably on you at some point. So we can just be like, all right, if you should go. Should that be the third, tiebreaker right here? Instead of a resistance, Bradner whiffs out because he tied too many times compared to Fabian. That would be interesting. That could be an interesting adjustment. Um, putting more weight on wins tying a lot. Yeah, I mean, I don't hate it. I don't hate the idea of it. I would have to have it be argued for me, argued to me as to why it makes sense for me to like fully be down with it. But I don't like in my head right now. I'm like, I guess I don't hate that idea, the incentivizing tying just because it, you'll lose out on seating. You also cut. could just do the asymmetric cut, which is what they did at Worlds in 2022. Yeah, you could do the asymmetrical cut. Um, the other thing would be to just make it a top 16, right? Just have a full on. You're playing for top 16. But at that point, I think you'd have to give a higher seed an advantage. If we made it a top 16 cut, you would have to have... Look what the bubble seed. would have looked like if we were top 16 cut. Yeah, but... This 34 but if, makes it in, and then boom! But there's always going to be, like, some growing Someone's going to miss out at some point, right? Someone's always yeah, going to yeah. be the first person out. Unless you do, like, an... It literally would have to be asymmetric cut. Yeah. I, I like to cutting to a top 16 a little bit more. But if you do go to, go to a top 16, I think you definitely want to give the higher seed an advantage in the form of pick first or second as the higher seed going to every match after that. What that if... It? Here's go a ahead. thought. 6-2-1 to make day two. Day two, single elim bracket. Back, Off back the rip. What we used to have. That's literally what we used to have back yep. at Nationals in 2010, 2011. That's what it used to be. Um, what did you think of it at the time? uh i mean i didn't know anything else <laughs> so i was like fine i was like oh it made cut let's go <laughs> uh and you lost in cut you're like all right that's still fine i don't love it i think i would still prefer i still prefer a day two swiss into a top cut a little bit more margin for error because like imagine going set 9-0 i guess we, we definitely need the higher seed uh advantage there as well but i i like day one swiss day two swiss top cut you know what the top cut should be i guess is the question i think i would like to just see us cut to a top 16 to be honest personally 
That's what I would like to see. Yeah, I would probably lean towards the asymmetric cut first or adding the extra round of Swiss to day one. Day one. Yeah, I wouldn't yeah. hate that as a that solution might be the, here. That might be the best solution with how, how quick these turnaround times are, how be, are starting to become in day one. Yeah, and the then best. you have to go uh, 21 match points, six and three to make day two. Or seven and three, I, sorry, seven and three. Yeah, I just want to know. I just want them to tell us what it is and when it is. Like they need, I'm sure... Maybe not too many people have, but I'm sure at least someone, at least one person has stopped and thought about, wait, what happens when we get to 4,000 masters showing up to these tournaments and we want that to happen and we have the the cap space for it? What happens when we're like, do they have to go 15 and 0 or are we going to try and do something else? Right. And I think we want a little bit of margin for error in something like a trading card game like Pokemon. I'm sure they want that. So I just want them to tell us what they're going to do when we hit that number and what that number is. But I'm sure going into next season, if not the season after for after for sure is when we're going to need to know what happens next. So we'll get there eventually. Well, let's get into the results from the actual tournament at this point. And yeah, the Orlando regional championships was won by Liam Halliburton playing one card off of towards 60 from EUIC. So just taking the list going with it. Um, he even tweeted like the week before the event, literally April 8th. So the tournament started what April uh, uh, 12th. So literally the Monday after EUIC, he tweeted, if you stink at the game, you should do less thinking and just trust in the players better than you. I, for one, will be locking in towards 64 Orlando <laughs> in toward. We trust. And you know what? In toward he trusted it paid off and he gets the win in the tournament. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, good deck, right? Can't go wrong with it. Uh, a lot of people felt that way. I believe I saw someone tweet it was like 1.4 or 1.7% of the meta was towards exact 60. Um, here, there was just one adjustment. Liam cut or added second Charmeleon and cut. What was the cut? I'm tripping. Uh, he cut Jirachi, added second Charmeleon. Oh, okay. No which Jirachi. He, said he never got punished by, he didn't get punished by because he didn't play against a lost zone deck. Yeah, so if you don't hit a loss on deck, you're never going to... And also, honestly, the Charmeleon can kind of protect you from the potential Sableye plays as well, because he did play the second mm -hmm. Flare Veil Charmeleon. So just getting that into play on one of your Charmanders and not having it be able to get Sableye can like save you from like the potential play anyway. And honestly, the second Charmeleon is really cool because it lets you be really more... A lot more aggressive with like Turo to pick yeah, up a can, damage like, Turo Charizard. Chain. It's like super yeah. cool, right? Because you're less... There's less stress, less emphasis on your rare candies. Or you can like turo your pidgeot a lot easier if you need to like to get it out of play is a liability i actually watched a mirror match between liam and rowan Stavano, and that's like what liam did to win game two pity uh turoed his pidgeot out of play just had a big charizard rowan you know did his thing set up on his turn uh i think actually just used cleffa in that last turn and then liam went rare candy pidgeot roxanne knockout and Rowan had two cards and just lost. <laughs> like, it was yeah, getting nice. the yeah the Turo on like the the board fixing that this deck can do is like pretty cool between collapse and Turo. Like, yeah, we were testing the Moon Moon deck, the hot new deck, um, leading up to the tournament. Me and my group were, and it was like if you if you go up against Towards List specifically, what happens a lot at the end game is like they take Pidgeot out of play, they collapse away their Charizard or their Rotom or whatever earlier, and then it's like they have a Radiance Art in play as one prize when you have two prizes left. Also, yeah, I just double checked the number of people in day one of Orlando that played towards exact 60 from EUIC was 42. 42. So 42 people chose to play the deck. And Zard overall was, I get, before we got about talk about the top eight, we should have talked about the meta actually. Uh, oh. Zard was the most popular deck in day one 22%, 519 people playing Charizard, which means that 42 out of 519 is 8% of the Charizards. Yeah, like you said, 8% were playing this deck. Yeah, so a lot of people bring in the Zard. And um, and you mentioned the Roaring Moon. There it is right there, fifth on yeah, the MetaShare chart. pop up pretty high. Um, actually, my me and my group's meta predictions were pretty pretty spot on for this one. I guess everything was a little, little bit lower than we thought. Like our numbers for everything besides like Roaring Moon were like a little bit higher. Um, like I thought there was going to be like 10% Chien Pao, 10% Hands, 10% Ostina, you know, 9.5, 8.6, 8.3, pretty close. Roaring Moon, I did predict around 6.7, and then Lugia I thought would drop down to like 6% as well. So 
that's one thing I take away from looking at this one. I was pretty happy with my meta predicting going into this. I was pretty spot on with that. Um, but it's not too hard of a meta to predict, I think, overall, just because, like, there is only that one TRS deck. It just is Charizard. Like, there's no yeah. discussion. It's like, oh, is Chien Pao close? Oh, is, is Lost Tina competing with Charizard? And are they both tier one decks and everything else? Like, no, it's like Charizard's tier one. Everything else has to figure figure out what they're doing to deal with it, to be honest, for the most part. And some th- a lot of people have been comparing this to the Lugia format from last year, right? Where was Lugia <laughs> was 30% of the meta day one. And then it was converting into like 50% of the day two meta. And we're not seeing that yeah. in the case, right? Looking at day two, Charizard did actually take a little bit of a dip in the meta share. Still by far the most popular deck, almost doubling Chien Pao at 19.5%. Chien Pao at 10%, 1098 Yeah, and we do see, I guess like the, another thing is like Roran Moon leaves the meta chart. Which I know it did got top eight, but I'm calling it two formats in a row. Roaring Moon is a fraudulent deck. Big time fraud. So you were pretty and, hype on uh, that deck at the end of last week, but I guess when you got down to Orlando and tested it. Yeah, actually it wasn't that good. Some, yeah, once I started playing some games with it, specifically up against Charizard, right? That's the benchmark. Can you can you 50-50 Charizard at least? And if you're only 50-50 in it and don't have an advantage against it, what is the where are the positives of playing this deck over just playing Charizard? Because you could just play Charizard and 50-50 Charizard as well, right? Sure. So um, that's like the question is like, okay, if you're going to choose to play this deck that only 50 50 Charizard, what else are you beaten so heavily that it's worth playing over Charizard? And yeah, I don't think it's, I think it's unfavored against Charizard after doing, I mean, it's basically all we did on Friday night was test Charizard against Moon, Moon, Moon. Um, I think it does have a better matchup against Charizard. Like, I mean, comparing to last format, I think you have a better matchup against Charizard than you did last format. Is that the deck's pretty cool, to be honest, the Moon, Moon deck. But, did Not you hear Kyle uh, Sablehouse's name for the deck? No. Dun Duns and Dragons. <laughs> it's a pretty, pretty good, good one. <laughs> that is pretty good. That's pretty good. Definitely a good one. But yeah, everything else is pretty much the same here uh, from day one to day two, swapping the Ancient Box, you know, picking up a little bit. And Ancient Box did do pretty well, hopping back into the top eight discussion. Jake Ewart was able to take the deck to a second place finish at the tournament uh the finals was honestly a little bit of a spaghetti fest i don't know if you've watched either yeah well, we are we, we turn <laughs> we were watching it and at some point we turned it off <laughs> oh no it wasn't it wasn't that bad it was just kind of funny we we're near the end of it it was like bro this is just over this is cooked turn this off but it was definitely fun it was entertaining yeah yeah so couple in game throws one from jake a couple throws from liam yeah um but yeah, it was, I mean, it was entertaining finals. I guess I'll say that at the very least. In game one, Jake jumped out to a pretty quick lead and he looked like he was in a really good spot because uh, if I'm remembering right, Liam like just didn't set up super well, didn't draw very well, whatever it was. It was. His prizes were also really bad in that game. He prized like Prime Catcher, Radzard, and Roxanne, all three of which are pretty important in the matchup. Um, and then Jake just like literally ran out of gas and lost the game because he just had nothing left in the tank before he could take all six of his prizes. Yeah. Um, well, and it all started with him just like choosing not to KO Rotom. When he yeah. Had the yeah KO on well, Rotom, which I didn't hate that decision. To I be also honest, didn't hate it. But I think you got to chop him up. You just got to go for it. Yeah. Get the two yeah. prize cards. Like I think he was in the moment thinking like prime catch or having access to counter catcher throughout the game is just so important for the deck. You would regain. You would regain it eventually though. Like you will sure. get access to counter catcher again eventually. I that's what I thought too when I kind of looked how it was going to break down. But the the less pressure you put on the Charizard deck, the more likely they're going to be able to use Turo at some point to just like yeah. negate your hits. And so just getting those early prize cards means you're going to be punching Charizards pretty consistently from there. And then hopefully we'll catch a turn or two where the Turo can't happen or where you have the boss response. Yeah. Um, so just like losing that pressure just feels a little bit awkward to like just not just like if you get that early lead it makes your next couple turns to just have to be set up attackers with Sada, not worry about doing counter catcher or boss plays, just kind of punch as much as possible and as hard as possible. Then in game two, uh, it was a little more back and forth. Liam seemed like he was in a pretty good spot, uh, but went to go check his prize cards to go set up his Bieberel. Uh Sorry, not went to go check his prize cards. He didn't check his prize cards. He played Ultra go. Ball to go get the Bieberel, and it wasn't in the deck. And then his turn was a lot worse. And then he like also grabbed some weird cards off quick search that I, at the moment was kind of questioning a little bit. Like he didn't go get the lost vacuum, the turn where he could have used it to get rid of a booster capsule to take an extra prize. He was like holding off for a turn. 
uh, but didn't have the Bieber L and then got rewarded by taking the Bieber L off the prizes and then immediately drawing into the lost vacuum off the Bieber L. And the Roxanne, I think I think. Got and both. yeah, he got like everything he needed. Yeah. He didn't he didn't need the vacuum that turn. I was having this discussion with Grant. No, no, no. It was turn. it wasn't it was uh he drew vacuum Turo. That's what it was. He the Turo. Okay, to vacuum Turo. Yeah. yeah, he didn't or, need yeah, yeah. the vacuum that turn. He could have gusted around for a turn. The Turo was pretty nice though. Yeah. He did want the Turo there, but you could have gotten Turo, Prime Catcher, Turo, Coward Catcher. Um, so getting that it wasn't necessary. Also, could have like still rock sand into collapsed or something like that. So didn't actually even need the Turo as well. So had like a little bit more flexibility than what showed, but it's not bad to just draw two really good cards immediately. And then Jake well. still would have won game two if he hadn't prized two ancient cards as his last two prizes. He was literally yeah. 10 damage off of one hit KOing a Charizard. And the difference maker was the lost vacuum sending the ancient booster energy capsule to the lost zone, not to the discard pile. So it's one less card for the, uh, Roaring Moon's attack to deal the extra damage. And yeah, uh, Liam ends up getting the 2-0 victory. Liam is definitely a better player, I think, than what that final match showed. Uh, <laughs> I, mean, yeah, I watched a lot cool. of his games out on the floor. Obviously, he also won Worlds as a senior back in 2022, so he's a very good player. Um, but yeah, I think there was some definite mistakes in that. It was a fun finals. Uh, <laughs> an interesting finals, I guess, because of all that. Yeah, yeah, definitely uh, one of those players who, like, was kind of waiting for their first really big finish. I mean, he got, like, a top eight or two last season, I want to say. I had I don't one think top a... eight last season. Was it with Lugia at some point, I think? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, so top eight last season. It's a pretty uh, good limitless page overall. Like, I don't think he goes to nearly as – like, he doesn't go to everything, right? Like, he goes to a handful of tournaments. He definitely goes to more than what this shows, though, because for a long yeah, time, yeah. he just played some really bad decks. <laughs> like He does be playing some bad decks, that's yeah. true. But – it seems like he's had a revelation with that tweet last week. Yeah. And it's like, you know what? I'm going to save the deck building for, I'm going to put the deck building on hold for a little while. Tor, yeah. what'd you play last event? Let me, <laughs> let me see that. And it pays off. It paid off. Congrats to Liam yeah. getting a big time statement win there as a young player. Uh, there, speaking of young players as well, we look at the top four. We've got Reagan Retzlov here with the Chien Pao. We also had Josh Frink getting their first big top cut finish with the Gardevoir, a deck that I've kind of been a fan of since EUIC. Um, yeah, so four unique decks in top cut, uh, in the top four, I guess I should say. Yeah, yeah, and like I guess like the, I don't know, maybe biggest surprise, I guess, is probably the Lost Box going as far as it did. Um, I definitely feel like it is. it has a unfavorable Charizard matchup. That's what I've heard from most players who like play it as well. It's like, it does have an unfavorable Charizard matchup, especially if, like people are doing box? like the. You mean the ancient box? Ancient box, not lost. Did I say lost box? You did, yeah. But oh, I, I figured box. that's what you meant, yeah. Yeah, especially if people are leaning toward more towards the toward build with the Turos, that makes it that much harder. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. Are usually looking for some kind of two hit KO on a Charizard at some point throughout the game, but it can be completely negated with just like kind of chaining Turos and collapse and stuff like that. There were also a bunch of players that had uh, Heroes Cape in their Charizard list as well. Yep, that makes it like impossible to ever get a one hit KO in the late game. Yeah, but yeah, it's cool to see the it's cool to see the ancient box get there. It's definitely a deck I want to put some more time into, and see how it feels. See if I feel like I can overcome the Charizard matchup consistently or not. Jake even played the one fire energy, so you can shred with Coridon if he went up against a Noivern, which is kind of funny. That is cute to see. Yeah, the tech for the Noivern. Yeah. Um, so there was the Shin Pao. Nothing crazy there. The Guardi. I guess we could take a look at the Guardi. Oh, did you already pull up the Guardi list? I did for a second, but yeah. I mean, yeah, the Chien Pao list looks pretty normal. It does have the Iron Bundle. I expect something similar to this to kind of be the norm. I mean, look, there's four people with it's this gone. exact 16, <laughs> top 64. Like The Reagan 60, uh, what is the format? Temple Forces format. Yeah. The Chien Pao. Yeah. yeah the big Ra thing the that Reagan, it was here. the Reagan 60 Lugia edition for a while. Now it's the yeah. Reagan 60 Chien Pao edition. I think the biggest thing to mention here is got the Silene in there to help it a little bit against Eerie. And then canceling Cologne is something that I've been seeing a lot of people talk about as not being worth it. And some people kind of not including. We see Reagan keeping that around here to help with that that prize trade into mostly Charizard, I feel like, is where it comes up the most. Yeah, and it's good against Gardevoir as well because you can uh, yeah. get the Manaphy KO there. But also, worst case scenario, you can also just Cologne the Mimikyu, which is otherwise kind of annoying to deal with. Yeah, you can also Cologne the the Flutter Main or the yep, yep. whatever the other one's called, the Clef Key. So you can Clef use Greninja key. and use mostly that Shiver Chill. 
And speaking of the Klefki and the Fluttermane and the <laughs> and the Mimikyu, here is the Gardevoir list. Pretty similar to Fabian's list from EUIC. This is the list Josh Frink and Alex is it actually the same sixty played to the tournament. It's not oh. the same sixty because it would say it right here, right? That's true. It's I think they have a third it's counter. Basically the there. same, yeah. Yeah, I feel like Fabian only played two counter catcher. I'm not sure on that though. It's close. Yeah, so the uh, Gardevoir deck. I think it is a, a deck to be hmm. It's a deck to be more respected moving forward. I think it'll continuously gain popularity as well. Yeah, I agree. That's what I was saying on the broadcast this weekend is like, I wouldn't be surprised if by LA, this is like the fifth or sixth most popular popular deck they won. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. I don't think, I don't know how high it'll get though on like the, the meta share though. I don't think it'll get super high. Yeah. Um, I don't think the deck is quite as hard to play as it was previously, um, but it still has some of the same intricacies with, um, you know, make sure you get your energy count right, your damage count right, and you know, being consistent with consistently, you know, utilizing your refinements correctly between thinning your deck versus not thinning your deck, what to refinement, so on and so forth. So it still has that kind of going on with the deck, but yeah, definitely excited to see where Guardia ends up. Cause I think it is a pretty solid deck overall. Luke Morosa, Celio's network himself also got a top eight finish. He was actually the first seed going into cut. Uh, he did lose to Jake in top eight, and I think he drew pretty rough. I was kind of watching all three of the top eight games, so I was, like, bouncing back and forth to all of them. But every time – like, when I looked over at Luke's game, it was like Luke had six prizes left and Jake had three. You know, like, it was yeah. just kind of too far behind. Yeah, and quite a few people did end up switching to that double Charmeleon. You see Luke has it in here as well. Yeah. Um, and then taking, like, the base of Tord's list as well. Like, the big yeah. – I think the cornerstones to, like, make your Charizard deck, like, based off of Tord's list is, like – Cleffa, Bibarel, Prime Catcher. Yep. I yeah, think I those three things is like what makes it like, oh yeah, this is like the Tord, the Tord uh formula, you know. That's where they started, yeah. But then yeah. kind of gave up on the control package, right? Only one Turo, no yell cheer. Has the sil or it's not silent the uh, TM devolution in here. Yeah, so a little bit more teched out for the mirror. Um, but it seems like a lot of the other, including Luke, good players came prepared for that TM Diva with that second Charmeleon. So probably not as a um, not gonna be as effective moving forward. I think we'll see double charming in a lot of lists. There was Cyrus McCain with the Roaring Moon deck, did have the Temple of Sinnoh in here. I think that is the only change from the list that Mark Hallstrump used to get top eight at EUIC. Cut a Roaring Moon there's for only, there's only two moon. Well, there was three artisan, I think. So it's like minus one moon plus oh. one rod, minus one artisan plus one. Yeah, 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 pretty much. Yeah, 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 pretty much the exact same. Yeah, the moon, moon. Uh, it made it onto the day one meta chart, right? It was like seven percent, yep, eight percent. Like I said, I think the deck is fraudulent. Um, just like last format, Moon stays fraudulent, but we'll see where it goes. Yeah, the uh, here. <laughs> Wancho actually interviewed one of the vendors, Dark Side Games from Las Vegas, Josh Bengal, <laughs> during the broadcast, and Josh said that on Friday they sold three hundred to Dunsparce. Nice. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure they were a big fan of yeah. Moon making top eight at UIC. It's like, yeah, can we do this again with like, I don't know, what's like a Meowskarada? Can Meowskarada get a top eight, please? Can we get a, a top eight from Meowskarada? There you go. Well, speaking of which, when we talk about Perth, <laughs> that's true. I say that, but to talk they about were close. There. They were close. The vendors, vendors rooting for rooting for the underdogs. Other than that, I mean, Fabrizio had his Chiam Pal list. Nothing crazy in here. It does have an Iona. Hold which... on. What's up? You say nothing crazy, but there's only three buddy buddy puffin in here. I feel like that's wild. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> Did have the Iono. Didn't didn't go to the side lean. Wasn't as scared of Yuri, I guess. I actually really I don't know, man. I kind of think that this deck after watching some of Reagan's games this weekend, there were so many times where it was like, I don't think he's in a good spot here, but if he could disrupt his opponent, he would be like pretty chilling. Or like just champ yeah. players in general. Uh specifically in Reagan's stream game, though, is what I'm thinking of. Um, hand disruption is feels unnecessary until your opponent knows you don't play it, and then yeah. it feels like, hmm, this would be pretty good here, yeah. Uh, and then, uh, it was Brandon Dean got seventh place with Lost Tina. Uh, well, this list has a, has a Thornton in it, it does. The Thornton's weird, definitely a little interesting. We've seen this is not the first time we've seen Tina with Thornton, though, right? We've seen that quite no. a bit, yeah. Um, yeah, I think this list is actually only two cards off of. Y'all's list from, from UIC. UIC. Yeah, it's pretty close. Has the board or the yeah has the board, the Thorn in there. Only two Tina V, only two Tina V three Nest Ball. I'm pretty sussed out on. Pretty sussed out by. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> I'm pretty like 
I don't know. That guy's pretty important. I had games that I played three Tina V. We played three Tina V for Nest Ball here at Orlando. And I had times where I was like, bro, I can't find these Tinas, bro. I need these guys. Where are they at? Um, <laughs> no VIP actually, pass hurts. Yeah. Ending the tournament, I feel like moving forward, like four Tina V might be the way because you don't need four. Finding is just super important. And then it like frees up your Nest Balls to find other stuff as the game progresses, basically. Um, well, real quick here, let's talk about any other interesting day two lists. There was one uh future hands in top 16 i don't remember seeing anything crazy in this list loaded in yeah it looks like a pretty normal list to be honest i think this deck gets a lot better if all the zards are switching to prime catcher i will say if there's no i don't know about uh, a lot maximum belt okay a bit better a bit better it yeah, helps it, it helps it i don't actually know how much it helps i have to like play i've never played the future hands i still have yet to have played any of the future hands i hope it helps it but there was Zach Lesage getting top 32 with the Archaea, or Archaeops, the uh, Lugia Archaeops. Pretty standard list here. I like that. The four, I like the four Manchino for Lugia V. I really like that. So anyone who's like looking to go with Lugia, you have to just, be, the deck needs to be like, I was going to use the four word research ruthless. in here as well. Not sure about the research. I haven't really delved into that. I was going to use the word ruthless, but I don't know, ruthlessly consistent might be the best way to put it. Like that has to be your focus. It's just like, I get it. I'm Lugia. I don't really do that much, but if I can do this, I'm okay. You got to like fully play down that, that line there. I'm just doing one thing, two things, but you got to try and do it as consistently as possible. No and more then, gimmicks. Got to get rid of the gimmicks. The vacuums, the maximum bell. So it's got to go. We got to be consistent. And then Drew Kinnick got top 32 here with origin form Dialga. No TM evolution and also has a maximum belt in this list. Yeah, I have no. I honestly have no thoughts on Diablo. I haven't played with the deck like literally at all. Has TM Evolution been like the standard? Uh, most of the lists we've seen have had it. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I have like for this deck for me, I have no clue on it to be honest. I, I don't think it from my experience. Um, like watching people play the deck, it doesn't seem great. Still, like it just feels like it's your charge on matchup is not good or not favorable or fifty fifty. Like that's what everything comes down to, is your charge hard matchup. That's like literally like why you should or shouldn't play a deck basically right now. Yeah. Which is not the worst thing ever. Um, it feels like we're like lacking a little bit of like tech options for the Charizard matchup, just kind of like across the board, right? They gave us Verizian, but like Verizian's like a little bit um Iron Leaves. They gave us Iron Leaves, but Iron Leaves is like a little bit like restricted, you know. Obviously it needs grass energy, so I don't know, maybe some cool future boxes. Or do you want Drapion, but for Charizard? Not really, but I don't know. Maybe more decks just need to be running TM Devos and just like spamming them against Charizard. It doesn't work if they got double million. I mean, yeah, that's true. The double million, like, yeah, Charizard has got a lot of flexibility to answer a lot of matchups. Eerie, for the Chien Pao. Got a lot of HP, does a lot of damage. Those are two things that it does do. Yeah. <laughs> it's tough, man. It's tough out here. It's, it's Charizard's world. It doesn't feel though like like you mentioned at the beginning. The um, talk about this. Stuff. I don't think it's bad as Lugia. Yeah, I don't think we're gonna hit Lugia numbers with it. I think there's like if it's a harder deck to play than Lugia was as well. Definitely, definitely. Mirror match is way harder to. I don't to think play. that the deck is extremely hard to play. Uh, but I think like how much focus is on it. That's what makes it harder to play too. Like yeah. all the little. Uh, little like pass to navigate through to like play around TM Devo and play around yeah, yeah. your opponent's eerie and potentially and all that stuff is like the, what makes it hard to play right now for sure. Yeah. And then the mirror specifically is kind of a, yeah, is a tough matchup. It's a, yeah, the better player most often wins the mirror match, yeah. which is, which is something nice to see, especially when it's from the, the top. Of, although a lot of the pre rotation Lugia players will tell you the exact same thing. So I don't know. <laughs> Uh, well, let's recap awesome. our predictions real quick, and then we'll get into the results from Perth and the Singapore Regional League Tournament. Uh, first prediction was how many Charizard would there be in the top 32? Real quick, let's count. One, two, three, four, five, uh, six, seven, eight, and then what is this one without Pidgeot? Is it Bibzard? It's nine. nine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, got, nine. It's, it's got two Bibarel, one Pidgeot. So it's nine Zard. Azul said seven. I said nine. Easy. Yeah, I ran back. <laughs> I ran back my same prediction. I was like, there's no way it goes. I feel like it shouldn't go up, but maybe it made sense for it to go up because Tor did just win. Maybe she Our go other prediction was how many non rating zone competitors would be on top cut. So pretty much players who are not from 
the U.S. and Canada rating zone. Azul said two. I said three. We were both pretty wrong. It was just one, and it was Fabrizio getting the top eight finish with Chiam Pao. Uh, there was a couple people close. You know, William and Pedro were in day two. Another Brazilian player, Anthony Ribeiro, in day two as well. Uh, but it was ultimately just Fabrizio. And then our last prediction was what a spec will be in the winning deck. As we'll said, prime catcher, bit of a cop out answer. If you ask me, <laughs> but he was correct. I said, master ball, a bit of a silly answer. If you ask me <laughs> and, uh, you know, you reap, you reap what you sow and, uh, it was not master ball. Yeah. Not even close. So, uh, yeah, let's really quick look at both Perth and the Singapore Regional League. We'll start with the Perth Regional Championships. This tournament had 257 players, the largest Perth Regionals of all time. So great to see the game is still growing across the board. Um, but yeah, if you look at this top 16-ish, there's a lot of Charizard. Yeah, a lot of Charizard towards the top of day two. Which I don't know, I guess that makes sense, right? Like you get everything everyone gets into day two, and then the best deck all the best players the played it as well. Yeah, all the best players. And uh we saw Kaiwin take it all down with the Pidgey Zard. Um and the list I believe was like one card different than what Brent played. They do work together. Um or have worked together in the past. I believe they still work together. Yeah. And it was the kind of like the it was like the lucky build, but Changed up a little bit, I guess, from what they played at UIC. Now has the B barrel in there, so it's like kind of taking the best of 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 both worlds there. You know, get the B barrel involved with the lucky, the control, more control package type stuff. I guess like the biggest thing to note that's missing from the deck is the lack of Luminian. Um, so it's kind of like the big standout to me, where it's like, okay, that's a card, that's a big card that's missing. But you are like adding like that extra draw power consistency through the B barrel. So once you get like B barrel and Pidgeot set up and online. Not too worried about not having Luminian, but definitely like the biggest standout to me. Yeah. You do have the Eerie and the Team Devo with the Reggie yep. Alecki, like you mentioned. Brent was playing the same deck, and it was also a Charizard Mirror in the finals. Jordan Palmer was the other side of that finals match. Uh, Jordan did have position. a couple interesting cards here. Yeah, he's yeah. got the, the Penny. He's got the Hero's Cape. Got the Magma Basin. I actually am kind of a fan of the Magma Basin. Um, does also have a double turbo energy, but yeah. I've actually thought about what if you played Magma Basin instead of like the second Super Rod? Could you get similar value from it? Um, but yeah, it feels like the double rod in here. Yeah, so it still has the double rod. So it feels like this list from Jordan is just trying to use Rad's art a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah, I guess like a, like a big play that this this build can make is the Defiance Band Rad's art play to KO Pidgeot EX early on in the game. Um, you can't do it with the double turbo because that reduces the damage you do by twenty, but you know, do it on like after they've taken the, what their first two, not two prizes, after they've taken their first three prize cards, you could make the play happen. Yeah, you could technically um, do it after they've taken their first prize, right? You just well, load it the... up with Charizard, attach. Oh, true. Yeah, I guess you could just go all the way out there. Yeah, that's a lot of resources to put into care of their Pidgeot, especially with people playing the B barrel now. But if they don't have the B barrel set up yet, I guess. Um, yeah, so this build is interesting. It, like I said, it, it does seem like it heavily is like trying to chain Charizard or Radzard. Through the Magma Basin, through the Double Turbo. Double Turbo does let you attack with Pidgeot as well, but that's kind of whatever, to be honest. Yeah, it doesn't come up that often. Yeah, maybe in like a really unique situation, it could be pretty cool. You clutch, can retreat but... a Charizard with Double Turbo, which is kind of nice. Sometimes you want to retreat a Charizard, and then you have to like worry about like getting no energies back on it, maybe. But that's like no collapse to take advantage of, like, well, I guess like if you're retreating with the Double Turbo, you're trying to keep it alive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, never mind. Which like, comes up a little bit less often than that. like wanting to retreat and get it out of play. Yeah. It also lets you retreat the B barrel as well, I guess. It gives you a way to retreat B barrel. Uh, which is like a thing that almost came up for me multiple times against Charizards was potentially trapping their B barrel and like Sable Lion or Greninja and around it after I trapped the B barrel on the active. Um, when they didn't have their quick search quite set up online, so I knew they wouldn't be able to like just go get Turo and Turo the B barrel. Didn't really come too much. Yeah, interesting builds. I don't know. A lot of the cards seem a little bit too janky to me. Um, and Hero's Cape is like the worst of the three A specs that people play in Charizard for the mirror match. Charizard is the only deck that plays vacuum consistently. Yeah. You're not going to really get value out of Heroes Cape pretty much ever in the Charizard mirror. So you'd always rather have Maximum Bell or Prime Catcher. But yeah, so that's like definitely one thing that another thing I said is to me is like, do we really want to be playing Hero Cape, the worst of the A specs in Charizard for the mirror? I don't know. That, fe that feels a little off to me for sure. 
I think one of the big talks of the Twitterverse today was definitely seeing Thomas Slater get a top 32 finish with Meow Scarada. Yeah. A little spicy out here. Honestly, with how good Charizard is, how popular it's becoming, it does open up opportunities for these kind of decks to potentially be good. We haven't really seen like a deck rise to the top that just like solely takes advantage of Charizard's grass weakness. That and that's because you have Radzar to kind of back you up and make it awkward for a grass Pokemon to actually deal with Charizard consistently throughout a game because you just don't have to set yep. up as many Charizards as you think. Um, because you have Radzar to back you up. But I don't know, maybe Meowskarada can get there. It'd be interesting to see for sure. Yeah, it just um, depends on like how good or workable its other matchups are, really. Yeah, that would be a big thing for sure. Um, but it's a big Pokemon that hits pretty hard. And yeah, it's definitely interesting moving forward if we start to see more decks pop up that kind of are solely built to beat Charizard. Um, but it does feel like the meta is a little bit too wide for that to happen overall. This isn't, and even in like the pre rotation Lugia format where Lugia was 30% into like 50% day two, you still had to beat other stuff, right? Yeah. So you definitely, you can't give up on everything just to beat Charizard. I don't think Meowskarada quite does that. And honestly, I don't even know if Meowskarada is favored against Charizard because of Radzard. It is weak to fire. So a couple of Radzards are going to make things pretty difficult for you. Uh, but maybe some kind of like spread strategy is what you kind of go for with a TM Diva more often than just kind of when it came in the active over and over. And now let's look real quick at the Singapore Regional League Tournament. Uh, it was a pretty interesting Tina list that took that one down. It was Giratina, you know, Lost Zone, Iron Leaves, but it's also got some Lightning Attackers in here. We see one Iron Hands EX and a Raikou V. Raikou v. Um, still has the Water Energy in here as well for Radiant Greninja. I would have assumed, like, when a I saw lot. the attacking lineup, <laughs> it's like, okay, they must be giving up on Radiant Greninja. But no, they've got all the options available. Yeah, the biggest thing this puts a strain on is actually utilizing Iron Leaves. Um, that's the biggest thing you're kind of missing out on here. The biggest thing this puts a strain on is using friggin' flower selecting, to be honest. Like, <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's a lot of matches where you can probably write off the the lightning attackers. Sure, sure, sure. Got sure. the iron hands there for like an aggressive option against stuff like Charizard for two prize cards aggressively, which could be really, really nice. Uh, or it's in there to go up against other lost zone decks to get more aggressive prize card draw. And then the lightning attackers obviously are really good against Lugia, which is probably the main matchup where you get the most value. Raikou to KO Lugia V's is really, really good. Um, these and V stars, and then the hands, but you get like two prize cards on an Archaeops or a Chin, uh, Chinchino is where it'll shine the most, I feel like. Yeah, so that was it's interesting, interesting for sure. There was a decent amount of Arctina as well that did decently. There was also some Arctina in Orlando that did okay. Um, I'm so not sure about Judge is really good right now, to be honest. Judge yeah. does hit a lot of decks pretty hard. Um, <laughs> but I'm not sold on Arctina as a deck quite yet. Uh, I am kind of sold on Judge being really good right now. Like, Charizard does not like getting Judged turn two. Might be the deck that utilizes Judge the best. Yeah, I mean, I think it is, yeah. What was what was the deck that utilized Judge the best last format? Was it still this? What do we Probably have? Mew. No, it was Mew. Yeah, Mew, Mew, Mew. Mew for sure. Yeah. I mean, any deck that can utilize it pretty aggressively. I mean, we think back to the Let Loose Marshadow days. That card was ridiculous. I mean, you got to play a supporter alongside using Let Loose, but still, like, just getting your hand shuffled down to four kind of sucks. Imagine any Let deck Loose can... Eerie. Yeah. Let, ooh, okay. Let loose Let grabber see. eerie going first. <laughs> we have seen some decks with grabbers. I saw an Arceus deck with grabber at EUIC. You know, it was like just an eerie grabber Arceus deck. That was it. That was the deck. One um, other thing I just got to say here is if Xavier Chua, if you're out there and you're listening, we've got to see your future box list. You got to leak it. Just what leak the heck? It. On. When is the next Singapore Regional League volume? If it's not until next format, you got you to share the sauce with everyone else. Come on. What's happening here? You think it's just Iron Leaves? What if that's good? <laughs> well, that'd be kind of similar to like, uh, are you like not even Iron Hands, you mean? Yeah, what if it's just Leaves, Maridon, Crown? Crown. I can see it. The thing is like in that, it, theoretically the prize trade for a, a Iron Leaves based deck into Charizard isn't that bad. Because if you go second, Maridon for one, and then go Leaves, 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 you win. It doesn't even matter if they use Radzard at some point. The only thing that they could catch you with would be turn two Candy Zard Countercatcher going first, KO a uh, Iron Crown. That's the only thing they could like kind of sure or fix the price trade up for them with. But hard for them to do that after they go first. So I don't know. More well, leaves. More leaves. More leaves could be the answer. Reboot pod, get in there. There we go. Need the pod. 
There is a regional championships this weekend. It's Sao Paulo regionals down in Brazil. We've also got Indy on the horizon. Players are definitely still competing at their locals, trying to wrap up their invites. Um, so how, with the results from this weekend's tournament, how do you think the meta shifts, Azul? What adjustments do you think? I think if I sit down across from someone and they flip over Charmander, I am assuming that there is a very high chance they're playing Prime Catcher, not one of the other A specs. Yeah, probably. Um, I mean, I think Charizard can only get more popular. I don't think it's going to go under twenty percent. Um, we could see by the end of the format if something if the, if it can't if the format can't be fall, solved enough to deal with Charizard, maybe we do see Charizard push for that thirty percent by LA, right? Um, I think the only thing I expect to really change from Orlando's like day one meta percentage is Roaring Moon probably is not going to be seven eight percent moving forward. But besides that, I don't know. Um, I don't think too much shifts. I think we're we're looking at kind of the roughly the same meta moving forward. We'll see though. We'll see what happens because like this next week we've got the major right. We got Sao Paulo happening. Um, you know if there's going to first... be a stream for it. There should be, yeah. There should be a stream. I'll, I currently have it on my calendar to be restreaming it, so yeah, hopefully there yeah, is. I was going to say, are you going to be restreaming it if you... <laughs> that is the plan. Um, But yeah, maybe we, we haven't seen... That's like another thing that can like be the big shift is a region getting its chance at the meta, right? A lot of good players down in Latin America who haven't played, who haven't showcased um, what they've cooked up in this format. That could yeah. still be... It's true. Um, a big meta shift, big meta changer. And sometimes it only takes one player playing a good deck and getting a good finish, and that's it. And then all of a sudden the meta can change off that drastically. So it's very true. Very true. I think like the biggest before. yeah, the biggest example recently I would say would be Juho winning LAIC. So many people had written off Maridon, and it went from yeah. like a six percent deck day one of LAIC into being the most popular deck the next week. And then at, right after that, Ross getting top eight at Charlotte yeah. with Roaring Moon. The follow up to that. So yeah. Yeah. Well we'll see what they cook this weekend in Sao Paulo. Got some predictions for it. If you didn't have anything else you wanted to talk about as far as meta goes. No, I don't think so. Yeah, let's make some predictions. We're going to stick with this one again. We've done it the last two tournaments. How many Charizard will there be in the top 32? Azul, you type your prediction. I'll type mine on the count of three. You ready? All right, let me think for a second. I got to think about this. On one, two, three, go. All right, I'm ready. All right, one, two, three, go. Oh, I put it. Oh, we did put it in the same spot. All right, Azul All right, so, said 10, I said 9. Nine's the number I've stuck with at EUIC and here in Orlando. I was right in Orlando. I'm going to stick with it, you know, keep it with the 9. Azul says 10, right around the same ballpark, pretty close. Yeah, I think we might see Charizard get more popular, be more successful, but I think there's a possibility it gets kind of put down in top cut by some some cool builds. Or, I don't know, I think Chi and Pao probably still has like an arguably decent matchup against Charizard, so maybe you see a bunch of Chien Pao's doing well or something. Highest placing non-Charizard deck. This weekend, it was Ancient Box. Does Ancient Box have a follow-up in it, Azul? Nope. No shot. <laughs> what do you but, think the highest placing non-Charizard deck is going to be? Um, I think it's going to be first. And I'm going to do one of my extended predictions here. So a deck that I think came up a little bit, not short, but I feel like, I don't know, maybe there just wasn't one of those players at this tournament playing it. I say that, I don't know everyone who's at this tournament playing what, but it's possible. But, I, I mean, we didn't see a control do very well at all in Orlando. But we got a super good control player down in Latin America, who I hope is showing up to the tournament. So my extended prediction for this one is Marco Cifuentes wins back-to-back -back regional championships in Brazil with control control is really good right now it's definitely a very solid deck i know marco's a control player just won guayania regional championships down in brazil hopefully is going to sao paulo so i'm predicting a dub here from marco at uh, the sao paulo regional championships coming up mm, a pretty a specific prediction yeah <laughs> a little bit specific. i wasn't meaning like what place the non charizard deck would be when we did this prediction as well like uh, what were you saying Oh, just, just like just deck, what the deck would be that wasn't. Yeah, I'm Charizard. going further than that. I'm going further than that. You're going all in the Hail Mary. So my my prediction is control, the highest placing non sure, sure. control. But I also expect it to get first with Marco piloting it. I'm actually gonna go with Chien Pao here, which is probably the easiest answer to safe. be honest. But kind of a cop out. Um, well, maybe a little bit, but it is Honestly, good, I think right? it, it underperformed at EUIC a little bit with no top eight yeah. finishes. Uh, but I think like it caught back up to where it should be in the meta, you know, a solid 
you know, maybe second best deck to, to Charizard with two top eight finishes in Orlando. So, yeah, I'll go with Champau. Sounds good. And then our final prediction is how many people in top 32 will not be playing Prime Catcher? Yeah, and... Prime Catcher has definitely established itself as the premier A spec, the best yeah. A spec. No, not no really a surprise to anyone, <laughs> I don't think. Uh, but there are still some decks that can utilize other A specs pretty nicely. Arceus decks like the Maximum Belt, the Ancient Box likes the Awakening Drum, Heroes Cape in certain things as well. And some people are even playing Heroes Cape in their Charizard. Some people still have Maximum Belt and Charizard. So, yeah, I'll go first for this one because you went first for the other one. Um, how many people in top 32 will not be playing Prime Catcher? I'm going to say 12. I'm pretty close. I was going to say 10. I think I'm. that's such a hard number. I don't have like no... Yeah, like what I don't know exactly Prime what the number is for like Charizard. just last couple tournaments. So I'm gonna go eight. I'm gonna go a little eight. bit lower. I'm gonna go eight. Yeah, that's a big spread between us. A little bit. I'm gonna go with eight though. All right. Prime catcher is pretty good. Pretty popular. More chargers are also gonna probably be converting to the ways of the prime catcher. So sure. We'll see. Right. Well, we've got a couple new cards we are gonna take a look at. Just a handful of them. Once again, as always, shout outs to Tuan Lay over on Twitter. Always puts out pretty quick and accurate translations when these cards get revealed over in Japan. And I think the first one we're going to start with here is Tatsugiri. So it's got the ability Crowd Puller. Once during your turn, if this Pokemon is in the active spot, you may look at the top six cards of your deck. Reveal a supporter card you find there and put it into your hand. Shuffle the other cards back into your deck. It's got one retreat. It's got 70 HP. These are pretty key statistics because those two statistics interact very well with other cards in the format. What do you think of Tatsugiri as well? I think this card is insanely good. I think this card is like broken. Like it's not quite still with Shirachi levels, obviously. Like I don't think anything can really compete with that. When we look at like basic Pokemon, look at the top cards of your deck, interact with a card. Um, I wonder if you would argue that, what would you argue is, you'd probably argue Mysterious Tale is better than this as well. Yeah, I think but, Mysterious Tale definitely is a little bit better than this, Yeah, but this is still very good. I mean, think about any of the decks. I was not super, uh, uh, high on this card the first time I read it. Um, cause I just hadn't, I guess I hadn't like really thought about it. I was comparing it most recently to like, I think similar examples to this were the, uh, Celebi and the Manaphy from Shining Legends, I think. Cards that were legal for a while and basically never saw play. The Celebi looked at the top six to look for an energy. The Manaphy looked for the Pokemon. or yeah. They were one or the other, some way swapped, right? Um, but this is pretty good. I mean, think about any deck that wants to play Poke Gear in it. Uh, almost any deck. Maybe not like, you know, Giratina or Lost Zone decks because you want to be pushing Comfey. But like, oh, I, think I think this would fit great in like an ancient box deck where your active is going to get KO'd. You send this guy up with a rescue board on it and you're looking for Asada or uh, Explorer's Guidance. I actually think this fits insanely well into Lost Zone decks. Um, okay. I think it's actually going to be ridiculously powerful because of the. Well, I mean, unless you find Colrus potentially, right? So I think the bigger thing is finding Roxanne at the end of the game. I, I think this specifically in Lost Box, because basically what happens with Lost Box is you get Ionode, you can't set your combo up, you lose. Unless you draw into Roxanne in the early part of your sequence, you Roxanne, you draw like your whole deck, you use your combo, you win. And this will allow you to find Roxanne as the first card to begin your sequence every single time. So your bench will look like two Comfies plus a Tatsugiri. Yeah, I think this card is going to be insane in Lost Zone decks to find those late game Roxanne's. Also help you find those early game Colverses as well, of course. And that's one of the things that you're like flower selecting for usually is like, all right, I'm digging for my Colrus. But now you're just like, push Tatsugiri, get the Colrus. And now you're using less Comfies, but your Comfies were trying to find Colrus anyways. So yeah, this card, insanely good in Lost Zone decks. But yeah, this is like a one of inclusion in Charizard. Um, I don't know. Maybe even you put as a one of inclusion into, you put it in like Guardi as well. Find your Arvin. Arvin finds everything else kind of situation. The bench is a little bit awkward for Already, so maybe not. But yeah, Tatsugiri, I think, is broken. And then in Lost in Lone Deck specifically, I think it's like super, super strong. We'll see when it comes out, though, um, what it actually ends up getting played in. I'm sure some other decks will enjoy it as well. But it's nice to have that kind of pivot Pokemon to work with. Because like, what do we see most recently? Someone was playing the, the Cyclozar in their deck. Because like, well, I need a pivot and there's nothing better. 
Uh, but we have a skateboard or emergency board in the format, so it's been kind of waiting for a partner like a Tatsugiri. I'm excited for that, Tatsugiri for sure. We've got Clefable here with, uh, it's a stage one, 120 HP psychic type Pokemon, two retreat cost with the attack metronome, two colorless, choose one of your opponent's active Pokemon's attacks and use it as this attack. Good old foul play Zoark is back. Two colors, not bad. I think, it was, was it you who I told you this? But I, yeah, we read the card and I was like, bro, Zoark is so sad that this card did yeah, not exist when Zoro Box was, uh, was around, but that's pretty powerful. Got double turbo in the format. Got some strong attacks to copy. Lost impact. Charizard's attack. Now, it does reduce the damage you would do by 20, which can make it awkward to KO a Charizard. Or the lost impact from the for the Tina. But you could play some damage modifiers to adjust around that. Or just don't use double turbos. Find some other way to set this thing up. It's good. It's a pretty cool one. Solid card. We got the, a Conkle. I gotta skip the Conkle. Wait. Conkle Dur here. 180 HP. Stage 2 fighting type. With two attacks, we're just going to read the second one here for a fighting and three colorless gutsy swing, 250 damage. But if this Pokemon is affected by any special condition, it can use this attack, even if it doesn't have the necessary energy attached. A free attack, Azul. We're not skipping over it, man. Free attack. Stage two, though. Yo, do you have to poison yourself or affect yourself by a special condition, which will probably be poisoned because of, was it the Brute Bonnet? Yeah. With the tool cards, that's probably going to be our way. Run its ability poisons both active Pokemon if it has a uh, ancient capsule attached to it. Yep, seems reasonable enough. Still only doing two fifty though. We're not KOing. What's the Charizard. new stadium card? Oof, you got me. I have Bro, no how clue. is Shrudel one of the newest cards? Look at him. <laughs> Bro, look at his <laughs> what? What is Shrudel man? Uh, look at what is that? It's kind of like a dog. God, this thing is disgusting. All right. <laughs> the Shrudel. Azul loves Shrudel, for those who don't know, for some reason. Big fan. Really, Everyone... he doesn't even know why. He he probably just He's likes a, it because it's funny. Him. He's a derpy-looking dude. All right, this is what I was trying to find. The Perilous, Perilous jungle. jungle here. During Pokemon Checkup, put two more damage counters on each poisoned non-dark type Pokemon. So that gets you to that 280 number to KO Tina's and Arceus. But I feel like we're moving... Getting to 280 is not that important anymore. It's like you're either knocking them out or you need to do 330 damage. Most importantly like, as well, this does not do extra damage to Charizard EX. True, yeah. <laughs> so we're still missing the one hit KO on Charizard, which will make things unfortunate, which is kind of unfortunate for the card. Hey, we got this guy. All right, hold on. I can't win Charizard. Radiant Hisuian Sneasler and... You got for me, Chip. Maximum belts. Okay, so we can KO one Charizard. We okay. can KO one Charizard. That might be all we need, though. Yeah. Just one one-hit KO. But we also have to set up multiple stage twos in a row because we're getting one-hit KO by Charizard. So yeah, we're probably not getting true. there. But we don't play any energy, so we have a lot of room in the deck. Honestly, because of the lack of energy, maybe there's maybe there's hope. And you wanted to skip the Conkle door, Azul. Go next. Let's go to the next card. The next card is more interesting, I think, for sure. Definitely. And that is the Frostlass. A good old passive damage uh, from an ability here. It's got Chilling Curtain, 90 HP water type, stage one Pokemon. The ability during Pokemon checkup, put one damage counter on each Pokemon in play that has any abilities, excluding any Frostlass. And yeah, so what do you think? It does stack, so you can do multiple yeah. Frostlass in play. I don't think it'll be attacking with Frostlass, though. It's not a very good attacker. Do you think? Not so, that one. Right. What do you think is up with these 90 HPs? What's up with this? True, we can attack with this one. We can attack with this one. Frostlass EX. Uh, what's up with 90 HP? I don't know. It's just like yeah. a normal threshold. Well, are, we, are we putting ourselves... Are we trying to keep ourselves in range of... Um, are we trying to put ourselves in range of getting killed by Greninja here? Or are we going to reprint Level Ball? Like, what is... What do you think their thought process is with that? You know, why not both, right? Balance it out so it can be KO'd by Greninja, but also at the same time, leave it a possibility for a level wall <laughs> reprint in the future. Why not? Because yeah, right? I'm curious, because we got this Frost Last with the 90 HP. They gave us recently the... Oh, this the is Dragapult, actually kind of interesting. The Dragapult EX's Pokemon as well has yeah. 90 HP. The Dracloak. Like, all right, what's going on here? Are we just trying to like let everything get bodied by Greninja, force us to play Manaphy, or are you going to reprint level ball? 
Let's so for us, happened. for us, Lass and Glalie do evolve from the same basic. So that's the only True. reason I'm like pointing this out here, because this Glalie does have an attack that could synergize with this Frost Lass ability here. Damage beat for one water energy, 20 times the amount of damage already on your opponent's active Pokemon. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of the combo. 20 right damage would... for each damage counter already on your opponent's active. Yeah. yeah, I think you would need some kind of initial spread. I don't know what we have in the format for that, but I think you'd want to spread with something else first and then go into it. Also, you could play the Miss Mages. Speaking of which. Spreads 20 to everything. Initial spread. <laughs> oh, I thought literally that was the name of the attack for a second, then I read it. Skywave. Little Molga here. Skywave. 10 damage. This attack does 10 damage to each benched Pokemon, both yours and your opponent's. Might still go with the Miss Mages, but I don't There's also, them. hang on, hang on. All right, let them cook. We got good old Spinda. Oh, is it legal? Dizzying spin, 10 damage to each of your opponent's Pokemon. Your opponent's active Pokemon is now confused. So no free retreat. Both are level ballable for the potential of the reprint. <laughs> There's no level ball. Not yet. Um. Yeah, so Spinda. I think I still lead, go for the Miss Mages, though. What set is this Palosand in? Oh, here we go. Um, this attack does 30 damage to each of your opponent's Pokemon. It's a stage one oh, fighting type Pokemon. Oh, no. Hold up. Hold up. We're, we're talking. What about the, the Ting Lu? Young Ting Lu? What are we doing here? This it's is the Ting Lu deck? It comes out in the next set. Oh. No, not this Ting Lu. There's the, the Ting Lu for one fighting energy. Discard a stadium. Deal 30 damage to each of your opponent's Pokemon. Oh, sure. Yeah. Luminous energy. Ting Lu. Keep the Galalies around for the late game. We're cooking. Let's keep rolling here. We've got the Blissey EX <laughs> with the ability Blissful Swap. Once during your turn, you may move one basic energy from one of your Pokemon to another of your Pokemon. Really a pretty decent ability. And then return for three colorless, 180 damage. You may draw until you have six cards in hand. It's a stage one, 300 HP, colorless type, four retreat cost. I don't know. This, uh, I mean does sizable damage that's a pretty decent attack effect and it's got 300 hp it's big put a cape on it we've got some decent special energy to work with i guess how are we accelerating to three energy consistently that would be the thing yeah. oh it's, it's ability we move the basic energy off of it we share in it set up another one repeat yeah. all right i'm down i'm, I'm here for the blissey your hp is a lot and uh, you get a little bonus here by being able to evolve from this chancy if you took Broken. it as a face down prize card and your bench isn't full you can put it onto your bench and then flip a coin if heads take one more prize you know what why not yeah may as well if the deck is actually good that'll be annoying to play against when your opponent gets a lucky bonus <laughs> imagine dude i mean that'd be kind of epic like for that to be how worlds is decided or something <laughs> let's see mirror in the finals one just has two uh two chancy prize it's the dub and the next one here is the reprint of an A-Spec. Scoop up Cyclone. Put one of your Pokemon and all cards attached to it back into your hand. Yeah, so decent A-Spec in the past when it was legal. Um, Already been bought out on TCG Player. The cheapest you can get one is 30 bucks. It'll be cheaper with the, the reprint. will be cheaper than that, though, so don't worry. You don't have to play the old-looking one. Master Ball is... A prime example of that. Five dollars. <laughs> and then the old one is still for some reason twenty-seven. And people just like that, you know, it's like the bling, it's like the bling, right? Having the bling. Sure, sure, sure. I don't think I haven't played any against anyone who played the why well, I, I haven't played against that many Lukias, to be honest. So, but yeah, Scuba Cyclone, it was a decent A spec in the past. Wasn't a computer search dowsing machine level, but not everything needs to be prime catcher in the current day and age. So yeah, yeah and then also a lot of other good ones. Your damage Charizard X. Yeah, well, I mean, that's pretty good. <laughs> and then being able to recover it with, I guess we still have just Silene. Or you could Silene and just get it back again, right? Blissey after you moved the energy off of it. Yeah, scoop with that Blissey. I mean, we have Charon's Care for that, though. We probably want, honestly, no, because we get the cape back. With Dude, Charon's if you have Care, four Blissey broken. in play, you yeah. can just infinite them. You literally well, you need, move. Yeah, if, that's the point of the deck. one takes a hit, you and it just... draws into, and it's a it's built in draw engine, too. You just move the three energy to the next. Honestly, Blissey, Blissey is broken. We shut it down, bro. Shut the game down, bro. <laughs> Pokemon's canceled. It's gonna be just not like eighty percent, 
eighty percent Blissey at these tournaments moving forward. There's Dude, just no way this deck's broken. Azul's winning NAIC with Blissey confirmed. <laughs> hey, was that good? Well, those are yeah. some of the new cards coming out soon. Let us know what you think of them down in the comments down below. But let's move on to everyone's favorite segment. But before we do, we have to take a moment, take a quick break, and thank our fantastic sponsor, Dragon Shield, for supporting us here at the Uncommon Energy Podcast. Of course, Dragon Shield makes some of the best card gaming and tabletop gaming products. They're the only sleeves that Azul and I use when we play in Pokemon tournaments. I've got my entire cube sleeved up in them. The majority of my retro deck collection is sleeved up in uh, Dragon Shields. So yeah, they're definitely our go-tos. Azul, what color did you rock this past weekend in Orlando? So I had some people take my Dragon Shields from me during EUIC because they didn't have sleeves on them. So I had to pick some up at Orlando's home with some coppers. And then in day two, I ended up on the yellows. Um, Like and... yellow mat? Yeah, yellow mat, yellow mat. I don't think honestly, dude, I've used before. Honestly, just the basic, I'm not going to lie, the basic colors always just feel so good to me. The yellows yeah. felt insane. I've said this in the past. Like, what was the ones I've used in the past? Like the purples or the green? It's literally just like, the green ones, the the blue ones, like just green, just green, just yellow. I mean, my yeah. go to has always been just the matte blacks. Yeah, yeah, for the last few years. Yeah, I don't know something about them. They just I like the the way they feel. I know like some people like the feel of like matte sleeves or like the dual matte dragon shields, but yeah, I just like the basic matte ones. And then the ones that are just the basic colors just feel so good to me. I might I might become a yellow main moving forward from here i know it's the ones that tord uses as well so maybe that's like the key mm. it's like the next step like you can only be so good at the game and then you also have to use yellow match dragon shield so one one step from there also i guess we should, secrets here we should study this i wonder what sleeves jason used <laughs> what sleeves did jason i think use? he used black ultra pros to be honest no that's not gonna cut it no yeah well yeah shout out to dragon shield as always Sponsoring. I apologize, Dragon Shield, for mentioning the words Ultra Pro during our sponsor segment. <laughs> Shout out to them, as always, for sponsoring the podcast. Like Chip said, it's the only sleeves we use and trust in our tournament runs. Check them out, dragonshield.com. Use code UEPOD. Get yourself 5% off and support us here directly on the podcast. And with that and... being said, it's time to move on to the real reason everyone tunes in every single week. Guess that flavor text where each week Azul or I picks a card, reads the flavor text and has the other host try to guess which Pokemon that card is. If you don't know, the flavor text is a little bit of text in the bottom corner of the card. You also could just call it a Pokedex entry, but flavor text is way cooler. Um, yeah, and if you get it right, you get four points. If you want some help, you can use one of our four lifelines, and the lifelines are what set the card is from, what stage the card is, and read an attack name. I am currently in the lead 24 to 15, as Azul. We both had some pretty good gains recently, though. We have, yeah. I got a, a three-point spike last week. You got a three-point spike the week before, so... Yeah, we've been doing decently, but it is my turn this week to pick a card for you, buddy. Are you ready? I am ready. All right, here we go. It lives in the ozone layer far above the clouds and cannot be seen from the ground. Oh, my gosh. Um, Read to me one more time. It lives in the ozone layer far above the clouds and cannot be seen from the ground. Ah, dude, that's so high up. There's no Pokemon that lives up there. Is it like Rayquaza? Maybe Rayquaza? The only one I can think of that, like... Maybe I just guess it. Uh, Reuniclus is also one that comes to mind. It's like being a Pokemon. It's like all the images like of Reuniclus on Pokemon cards. Like It's always in the sky. Like by clouds and stuff, I feel like. Maybe it is Rayquaza, though. Maybe I should just guess Rayquaza. See, I'm wondering if, like, any of these... I think I could maybe guess what sets Rayquaza is, is in by you. So maybe I'll ask you what set the card is from. That's probably worth it. Yeah, what set is the card from? The card is from Legends Awakened. Diamond and Pearl Legends Awakened. I don't remember if there's a Rayquaza in there or not. Diamond and Pearl Legends Awakened... Is that where we got Uxie, Azelf, and Mesprit? Did they come from there? I don't remember. They are from... 
Uh, what came from Legend? I don't even see. I don't even. That's I so think they. I think they are. That's so long ago. I don't know what's from Legends Awakened. I think I'm just gonna lock in Red Quaza to be honest. They are from Legends like... Awakened. I was pretty sure they were, but I was tripping for a second. Yes. Oh man, it lives hot. It... Go ahead one more time. Just give me the the flavor text. It lives in the ozone layer, far above the clouds, and cannot be seen from the ground. I guess an attack name would probably also give away if it's Red Quaza or not as well. So let's go with an attack name. Attack name Sky Judgment. All right, let's just go with Rayquaza. Azul. It is not Rayquaza. It is Rayquaza. Rayquaza. Oh, but of course. (laughs) I was so close. The distant cousin from Rayquaza. Rayquaza. (laughs) It is indeed Rayquaza. You didn't have a good choice on the attack. That was it. It was Sky Judgment. It is Sky Judgment. I you like, probably would have. Sounds... Would you have remembered this one based off the Poke Power Speed game? Yes, that is. I've some past um, memories of Speed Gain. So um, this Rayquaza, for those who don't know, was used in the 2009 U.S. National Championship winning deck from Kyle Puka Sukovic in his Lux uh, Ape deck as a one of. Because it can just build up energy and nuke something. <laughs> it's pretty decent. And not terrible. Uh, but I think Puka said that it, he would cut it, right? I feel like I have maybe heard that before as I think well. You've, I think you told me that. That you like talked to Puka about his deck. Once and he, Puka was like, yeah, the Rayquaza wasn't very good. Mm, I feel like I do remember hearing that. But I don't remember if I heard it from him or from someone else telling that story. Maybe. It's like telephone at this point. It's actually it the really best is. card in the deck. Um, <laughs> yeah, Puka actually told someone that it's the best card in the deck, and we're here yeah. now. Rayquaza was absolutely broken. I don't know. I've played that <laughs> 09 format a little bit, and I've played that deck, and it seemed decent to me at the time. I yeah, know. I know. I mean, it's just like potentially free energy acceleration and then being able to do 150 damage if you just get like – I mean, if you just start flipping on turn two, like the, the, the games back in the day lasted a long time. So Yeah. And you could uh, – the thing about this card as well is like you could play multiple and use the ability, each ability, right? Yeah, maybe this card was just broken, you know? Oh, wait. No, you can't use it if you have another Rayquaza in play. Ooh, okay, never mind. It's a one Rock of. and one. Always a one of. I feel like I've never read that part of the ability before. I feel like I've yeah, always... because you've only ever played a deck that had one of them in it, you know? <laughs> yeah, so I was like, you didn't even think about that. You're like, well, more of these would be sick. More coins? Let's flip. But this is a sweet artwork as well. Uh, as a Rayquaza fan, I'm a big, a big fan of this card. Um, I've got one in my in a portion of my cube that gets utilized from time to time. So yeah, it's a good time. I mean, so I could have got four points. I had it right off the rip too, you right? Did, I was like, you did. I was like, it's Rayquaza or Reuniclus. Those are the I don't know. Cards. That Reuniclus poll is kind of crazy. Isn't it like always in the clouds? I don't think so. <laughs> <It's artwork? laughs> this one is literally laying no. in the water. <laughs> <laughs> All right, never mind. The very first one I clicked I've never on. seen that artwork specifically. Go back. Let me see the other ones. Okay. It, yeah. uh, it's, it is, it's backgrounds are a little bit distorted. It's hard to tell where it is sometimes. Mountain. Look at the ones in the bottom right. This is a forest. No, no, but the one under that one. Where is that? The bottom right right there, these ones. What? Where is that? That's a good question. That could be this the is a shiny one. It's close enough to an ozone layer, you know? <laughs> yeah, sure, maybe. maybe right, there's some, there's so. some grass there. All right, well, good job, Azul. You got a couple points this week, so congratulations. You're catching up. A little bit more, just a little bit more. Well, let's close out this week's episode by talking about the Champions League Aichi results. So this was a tournament that took place in Japan this past weekend, and it is actually utilizing cards from the new set uh twilight masquerade i don't know what it's called over in japan but we will be getting it as twilight masquerade in may uh in just about a month uh but yeah those cards were legal it'll be cards like radiant or not radiant uh greninja ex but do they have the they they don't have all the twilight masquerade cards they got like half of them right now is that true yeah i'm pretty sure they get the rest of them when we get twilight masquerade so they might not Maybe have they don't have yet. yet. Yeah, they don't have everything yet. They they have some. I'm pretty sure they do have the Greninja. Those are, oh, or they might. This is what Crimson. This Haze? Is the Crimson set. This is yeah. This is the Crimson Haze set. But they'll get another set when we get Twilight Masquerade. So they don't have like the, the Twilight Masquerade cards, the mask cards yet. 
I believe. Okay. So the big cards in Crimson Haze, the Blood Moon Ursa Luna, uh, the Iron Thorns EX. Yep. Uh, the unfair stamp, also the A spec that lets you search your deck for three stage one cards isn't a that terrible one in the, the, the right deck. It's not good right now, I don't think. But uh, yeah, Evo those... just does everything that that card does. Yeah. But the Greninja is not there then. The Greninja is not here. Okay. That's I like feel a... like Hegster said something to me about. I was talking to him about how I thought Greninja seemed insane, and he said something like, "It's not doing good over in Japan." Oh, maybe it is legal. Oh, I don't it know. is. Yeah, yeah. Because the illustration rare of the green. Oh, it's right here. I'm. I just didn't see it because it's a freaking fighting type, man. I was looking in the oh. water types. Man, that kind of sucks if that card's not good. Because for those who don't know, this oh. first attack on the Greninja EX, it's a stage two fighting type Pokemon. But for one energy, it one deals water. 170 damage, and then you search your deck for any one card and put it in your hand. Yeah. And the second attack for one water, two colorless, 120 damage to two of your opponents. Is bench or is it bench or active? Could it be active? Uh, I don't, I don't know remember. For sure. Yeah, but 120 damage to two bench Pokemon or two of your opponent's Pokemon in play. I think and it is the same as G Max Rapid Flow, so I think it can be weak, two Pokemon. Weak to Psychic. That's a pretty good weakness. Like, man, that does kind of suck if that card's just not good. <laughs> like, Charizard yeah. is just better. I guess. <laughs> And yeah, Charizard did end up winning the tournament, and it was actually packing the unfair stamp as the yeah. A-spec of choice. So I mean, you we, can unfair stand plus eerie, right? That's kind of good. Each player shuffles there. So you can only play this card if one of your Pokemon was knocked out during your opponent's last turn. And then each player shuffles their hand into their deck. You draw five. Your opponent draws two. Yeah. So unfair stamp already getting up there, getting his high placements. Uh, the second place list, I believe, had Cape. Um, but the other Charizard in top uh, top eight also had the unfair stamp, which uh, yeah, I mean unfair stamp. I mean you don't even have to unfair stamp Yuri, just like unfair stamp, like set so much tempo. Even this um, guardy list doesn't even play the hero's cape. Plays unfair stamp. Yeah, <laughs> like it's kind of crazy. Card seems pretty unfair if you ask me. And uh, what are games gonna turn into? Where it's like you just have to risk it and hope your opponent doesn't have it that turn, like immediately. This and then Tina list plays there. unfair stamp. Jeez. This Arceus deck does play the maximum belt. It tells you uh, how bad Arceus is. It needs to not play Unfair Stamp to do well. This was the most interesting deck to me, to be honest, though. And it is just a quad Iron Thorns EX deck. Yep. So Iron Thorns EX, it's a basic lightning type Pokemon. It's a future Pokemon in its ability. As long as this Pokemon is in the active spot, Pokemon with a rule box in play have no abilities, except for any future Pokemon. Yeah, really good ability. And then its attack is really Bolt long. Cyclone for a Lightning and two colorless 140 moving energy from this Pokemon to one of your benched Pokemon. But this deck is literally four Iron Thorns and then just like four of a bunch of other stuff. <laughs> yeah, like mostly four Boss, four Arvin, four Iono, four Judge. You were talking about how Judge seems really good, right? Leaning on the disruption heavily. Four Crushing Hammer. Yeah, the Crushing Hammer Let's is the go. big thing. Love to see it. Yeah, leaning very heavily on disruption, but only um, three Eerie. Where's that fourth area? We need that in there. Two canceling cologne. What are we cologning here? What is getting cologned here? Mimic you. Why? Because you can't knock it out otherwise. You have no way to KO a mimic you. Oh, yeah, true. When you said mimic you, I was thinking of Klefki. I was like, what? You no, know, <laughs> you are right. Yeah, that is a way to get through mimic you. I guess, yeah. I guess maybe that's a beat. But Guardian can set up three of them. Four canceling cologne. Innovation for the deck. Try it out. <laughs> Yeah, but if you're you going like Cancel Clone plus Eerie, you know, you're going to hit a Super Rod at some point. You know, boss four times. <laughs> Just yeah, like the boss. terrorize their bench, I guess. You don't really need that. Yeah, I mean, this. these are the kind of decks that if it's good, it, it's kind of stupid because like the deck, you're not you're not playing Pokemon, right? This is like one of those decks where you're definitely not playing Pokemon. Same thing with like Block Lax in a lot of matchups like. Yeah, it's not interactive. It's like being like a tier one deck would be is like that is poor game design, unhealthy top tier deck. Like if Iron Thorns is like part of a bigger future deck, that's kind of cool. But if it's like caught Iron Thorns, attach, attach, attack, attach, attack, repeat, that's kind of boring, right? So hopefully this is not end up being a very powerful deck. It'll, be It'll definitely hope. be a little lame, but yeah, no surprise to see Charizard still does pretty well. 
There's nothing else crazy to really look at from these results. There was like a control lax that does play the Blood Moon Ursa Luna. So it's like you get two Radzards pretty much. There was also a Giratina list that played the Blood yeah. Moon Ursa Luna. Uh, this card is pretty just good. pretty good. Veterans Technique ability. This Pokemon's Blood Moon attacks cost a colorless less for each prize card your opponent's taken. And then for five colorless, Blood Moon does 240 next turn. This Pokemon can't attack. Yeah, so pretty, I don't know, broken card. It's just a really, really powerful card. Yeah. see a ton of play moving forward. And yeah, we're already seeing it immediately, right? On the, the first major tournament with the cards legal, getting its placements. Um, And then I think one of the more interesting things from this tournament is that the standard tournament uh, was not the only tournament that happened at this Champions League. Now, we don't know exactly what the numbers were, and there was definitely less people, but there was, yeah, yeah. was probably still a pretty sizable tournament uh, because there was also an expanded tournament run alongside the Aichi Champions League, and it was won by a Vileplume deck utilizing Bunnelby from Primal Clash. Now, if you don't know what this Bunnelby does, it's got two pretty solid attacks, 60 HP, and its first attack is Burrow. Discard the top card of your opponent's deck and Rototiller. Shuffle a card from your discard pile back into the deck. But the real reason it's useful in here specifically is because it has the Omega Barrage Ancient trait, which are kind of like abilities, but... It's just an extra piece of the card. It's uh, like the. It's, it's like what is it called? Terra. Terra. Yeah, it's like the Terra thing that Charizard and all the other Terra Pokemon have. It, that's a there was a different comparison, ones. but they're yeah. just different. There, there's like multiple. There's like Theta Stop, Omega Barrage. Yeah, it can uh, evolve immediately. Attached to energy. One, Delta Evolution. Yeah, yeah. Alpha Growth. Yeah. Way more so interesting remember than any of the names of any of them. Yeah, way more interesting than Terra whatever <laughs> but, but omega barrage says that this pokemon may attack twice in a turn so good. you can burrow twice you can rototiller twice or what this deck uses it for you can tm evolution twice so you can immediately get a stage two pokemon in play because the way it works is you go technical machine evolution get into the stage one and then you can attack again so you technical machine evolution choose the stage one you just evolved into boom all of a sudden you get your stage two in play and the stage two is this deck is aiming to put in play our vile plume with irritating pollen each player can't play any item cards and then also pidgeot ex with quick search turns out that's pretty yeah. good still and so it's like a it's like a i mean you i think you win by drawing prize cards right maybe maybe you don't have to though actually i guess you don't really have to you could just like yeah plumeria you got the team flare grunt you could just like play it as a control deck basically team skull grunt um but then you do have like the vile plume gx that can attack you can attack with uh, the Pidgeot if you have to. You can attack uh, this... with the other Vile Plume as well. Yeah, the one that can't be attacked by basics. Yeah, I'm sure it's in here more for the ability than the attack. Um, and this is like the first deck that we've seen Neo Up Energy in. But I guess it makes sense because what other A spec would you run? Yeah, Wait a second. You don't want to play any of the item ones really because oh, hold on. I mean, you could just play computer search for consistency, I guess. I just forgot about those, to be honest. You could have those existed search still, yes. Yeah, but I, you knew Upper Energy probably makes the most sense. But I literally forgot. You don't that, like, see Computer Search on turn one; it's useless. But Neo yeah, Upper yeah. Energy is probably fine any point, yeah. right? Yeah, I forgot that in Expanded, the new A specs are colliding with the old A specs. I didn't yeah. like make that yeah. connection at first. There you can still only play one, however. Uh, and then the other crazy thing about this deck, I gotta find this card. Um, is that it plays this Japanese only super exclusive promo card, which is called Firefighter Pikachu. Let me find it. Yeah, here we go. Firefighter Pikachu, uh, which is for a colorless energy, discard a fire energy from your opponent's active Pokemon. Yeah, so I assume so, this is like mostly in there for rainbow energy or like double dragon energy. Yeah, or um, if like, I guess like the Jir or something like that is Jirachi good. does that like, as well though. There's a lot of these like rainbow energies. Yeah, I mean expanded is just wild, man. I don't even know what to think. Jirachi's um, got to be better, right? Yeah, is that the same Ryota? That's 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 Ryota who's made top yes. of the world twice, right? Okay, yes, that's what I yes. thought. That's why I assume. And this is I don't even know what this is, man. What second, is that? Second place deck here. What does that right you do? Turn one horror house. Uh, GX, and then turn two, you use Electro GX's extra energy bomb. Once during your turn, you may attach five energy cards from your discard pile to your Pokemon. 
except Pokemon GX or EX. And any way you like, if you do this, Pokemon is knocked out. And then Alolan Raichu here, discard any amount of lightning energy from this Pokemon, then choose, then for each energy you discard it in this way, choose one of your opponent's Pokemon and do 30 damage to it. Is that good? Well, I think you can, like, go second board wipe your opponent. Man, dude, expand is wild. <laughs> it's wild, bro. Because you discard so many energies. You have four reverse yeah. energy. Four it's not even that much energy. damage, though, you right? Can, well, you can blow up two electrodes or three electrodes because you have did a that enough? Star. It doesn't feel like enough energy. I could be just wrong, though, I guess. Yeah, this I definitely feels like a worse version oh, of wait. that. Like the snipe, the snipe tool on the, the bottom right. What does that one do again? Oh, oh telescopic sight. As, oh, no, no, no. Yeah. That 30 more damage to your opponents. 30 more damage to your opponents. Oh, but is that Pokemon V and GX? Would that do 30 more for each energy or no? Like, no. Would each energy do 30 no. more? No. Oh, okay. No. Just 30 more total. All right, never mind. It's not as cool as I thought. I guess no. for each different one you hit, though, you do 30 more. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. I look at these expanded decks, I don't even know what to think, to be honest. Yeah, it makes me just wonder, like, if we had one expanded tournament, you know? No, don't do that. Just one. Nope. What would it be like, man? What would we, we don't want to know. Nobody wants to know. Lugia, Archeops, turn one, Wally into Lugia, get two Archeops in play, battle compressors and say, most of the current player base doesn't even know what, like, the majority of the format, like, what and the that's why we do. That's why we shouldn't bring back expanded. Just leave it. I'm, I'm for one nope. expanded tournament. Let's nope. just see. It's not. You don't think it would be fun to unleash the floodgates? These I mean, formats like, heavily watch favor it, the but... deck builders as well. You know, it's too many cards. It's too many cards. The thing is, like everyone would have a broke. Everyone would have a broken deck. You um, wouldn't even know which one was the best one, to be honest. Yeah, there's, there's no time to <laughs> test everything into everything. Like everyone would just show up with a broken deck. Although maybe the Barbloom deck is the broken deck because there's two of them in the top four. I guess there's also two of those Drago, Dragon Garb decks in the bottom four. Yeah. So it turns out Garbotoxin is still pretty good. Yo, Reggie Drago, it had its moment. Let's go. <laughs> Finally. Yeah, well, yeah, it turns out double dragon energy is pretty good. So yeah. Ability Makes lock sense. arm. Still chilling. Still out here. Yeah, I'm glad uh, we don't have expanded, to be honest. I, I don't think it should not should forever not be a thing, but I think they need to do like a big overhaul with it, which I don't know how, if they'll ever do that for like how it kind of exists in Japan. Um, yo, School of Cyclone as well in there. That's interesting. Yeah, they knew about the reprint ahead of time, I guess. <laughs> They're prepping, their testing. Yeah. Like, all right, let me try this with a scuba cyclone. Gouging fire dot deck. Oh, gouging fire with Volcanian EX. Steam up, more damage. One hit KO everything. See, this deck just seems bad to me. For all the cards that exist and expanded, how are we playing gouging? How are we just hitting our opponents active hard? How is that the... Well, if you do it super to? consistently, right? Yeah, but I if feel like... every single the... turn you're going to like 290 to the face sure but you look at like the top two decks and you're like okay this makes sense for expanded and then you're just like gouging fire <laughs> like i don't know that just feels off sure and yeah and that, i think that would ultimately become the problem with expanded is like the it would also be um, super unfun for anyone new to play in no one yeah. would want well, to play and in also like just it, it's probably fun not no fun for even the good players because it's like your opponent's deck just does something that is unfair and not fun to play against yeah i mean that's why i just don't really like the idea of it to be honest i'm not a big fan but what did what deck did you know. play to the last expanded tournament azul a doll or it was a doll stall Life, deck i think it was right? a doll stall deck yeah block like, snorlax didn't have yeah. that guy in there no the old one you had, had guru plus the thing that recovered tool cards and you got back Life mm -hmm. do and what was he? What was the tool? Oh, that no, tool Guru card that was banned. Guru was banned. No, not at Collinsville. Oh, was it not? No, Guru got it's banned been a long in COVID. time. That was five years ago, buddy. Yeah, Guru got banned in COVID. Okay, I'm pretty sure. Well, there was the expanded tournament. There was the standard tournament. It would. I think it would be kind of interesting to see one expanded tournament. Oops. Maybe we should throw one. Maybe we should throw the Uncommon Energy Expanded, expanded Classic. Exp Yo, yeah. actually, hang on. We might be on something here. Invitation Never. only Expanded Tournament. Could do that. I know a couple players who would be down. Yep. Get Stefan and Great Manly. Yep. See what they cook up. Yep. That could be interesting. <clears throat> I don't know. Maybe we're doing something with that. Uncommon Energy Expanded Tournament. All right. 
Chip, I think that's everything to talk about here on the podcast on the main episode. I think it's time you send us out so we can get into the bonus episode over on the Patreon. Yeah, let's do it. Thanks a bunch to everyone for listening. As always, we very much appreciate your support. And if you want to go that little extra mile to show your support even more, be sure to leave us a like, a comment, a review, a rating, subscribe to the YouTube channel. All those things help us out a bunch. Let us know you're enjoying the content and they help more people discover it for the future. And if you want to stay up to date with us, the best place to do it is over on Twitter. You can follow myself at Chip Ritchie. Azul is at Azul underscore GG. You can also follow the podcast at Uncommon underscore Energy. Appreciate the support as always. Good luck to everyone playing in Sao Paulo this weekend. Catch you all next Wednesday, Wednesday, 7 a.m. Eastern.